Welcome to Fred Led Learning Community for Family Leaders. Um, as you're doing, if you haven't done so, rather, uh, please use the chat box to introduce yourself. We're seeing people from all over the country, which is always uh, a good thing. The title of our learning community today was, uh, What is MHBG? And the answer, of course, is Mental Health Block Grant. Um, before we go any further, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jane Walker, and I'm the Executive Director of the Family Run Executive Director Leadership Association, otherwise known as FREDLA. We are a proud partner in the National Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health, operated and coordinated through the University of Maryland under a contract with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Substance Abuse, and Mental Health Services Administration. We have a lot of new people on our call today, and we welcome you. For those who are not familiar with FREDLA or with these calls, the learning community calls, FREDLA is a network of family-run organizations. There are about 120 family-run organizations across the country and they were all started by families caring for a child or young adult with mental health or behavioral health needs. Fredla's mission is to build leadership and organizational capacity of family-run organizations to promote their value and influence policy for our children and families. Did you know that every state, territory, and the District of Columbia receives a mental health block grant? from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Well, let's take a quick poll and see how many of you are actually receiving block grant funds from your state. So the first question is, does your organization receive block grant funds? You can either answer yes, no, or what? You mean there's money out there and I don't know about it? Or you can abstain from voting, of course. Let's see what we have here. The polls are open, folks. You know how important voting is this time of year. So it's an even split at this point. Well, a few more, a few more are responding that they receive Grants, but only slightly, okay. And just a few people don't know if if they receive block grant funding, and and that's not uncommon at all. Very hard to sometimes track block grant funds. Okay, our second question is: Do you or anyone from your organization serve on your state's planning council? Yes, no don't know what the heck is a planning council or no vote. Okay, again, pretty even split. Well, you're voting. Okay. So we have a few more people that are on their state's planning council or someone in their organization, which is a good thing. Okay. So by the end of this presentation, you will have answers to these two questions about what is a block grant, what is a planning council, and uh, lots more. So we're very pleased to have with us um, Keith and Thomas who is the Acting uh, Director of the Division of State and Community uh, Systems Development at SAMHSA. Uh, we were scheduled to have Centrice Bellamy with us. Centrice, unfortunately, is ill and could not be with us today. But um, to our surprise, we just learned that um, Keithan is actually stepping into Centrice's position as of next week. So we have with us the Acting Division Director for um, the Division of State and Community Systems Development. 
So we extend our congratulations to Tyson and are so glad that um, he can be with us today. So in addition to Tyson our, uh, and our, from SAMHSA, we have Sue Smith, Executive Director of the Georgia Parent Support Network and someone known to just about everyone in the family movement. Sue will share her experiences serving on the Planning Council in Georgia. And of course, at the end, we will have time for your questions. Please enter them in the chat box as we go along, and we'll be um, pausing to ask some of them at, at uh, certain times, and anything left over we'll be uh, able to answer at the end. The slides that you're seeing are available for you to download in the box that's underneath the chat box. Uh, it's called Files, and it's titled, What is MHBG? Do you can uh, download those. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Tyson. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm so glad you are all able to join us today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Jane Walker for inviting us to this webinar. So um, I wanted to give you a brief background. Uh, the Mental Health Block Grant, um, I, I think uh, some of you know and some of you may not know, uh, but uh, if, you, if I have to give you the entire background, it may take a longer time, so I'm going to give you a 60,000 foot level view of what it is. So the Mental Health Block Grant was evolved out of a 50 year history of, uh, support, uh, of support by the federal government to the states for the development of community based system of care for people with mental illness. So in 1963, during the Kennedy administration, the Community Mental Health Services Centers Act was adopted to support the development of comprehensive mental health services in local communities. So the mental health block grant was one of the several block grants um, later during the Reagan administration um, um, as part of the new federalism initiative. So the driving principle behind the new federalism uh, was turning control over resources to the states which would better know their unique um, who, the, the state who knows better of their local needs. So the Mental Health Block Grant actually was established in 1981 when the Community Mental Health Services Centers Act and several other categorical federal funding streams were merged. Um, in 1982, um, the Mental Health Block Grant was administered by Adam Ha, uh, which is the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Services Administration, which was a uh, uh, the previous agency that was part of um, National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so subsequent legislation after 1982 um, and policies emphasis on using the Mental Health Block Grant for transforming the mental health systems to facilitate the development of effective community-based system of care for adults with serious mental illness and children with emotional disturbance. Um, so like I mentioned, um, Many of you may or may not heard about Adam Ha, uh, but addressing the mental health needs of the nation evolved throughout the 20th century. In 1946, Congress established the National Institute of Mental Health, which is part of National Institute of Health, and in 1973 established the Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration, or Adam Ha, within the National Institute of Health, which uh, is um, which was supposed to provide. Um, services uh, for people with mental illness and, and uh, children with emotional disturbances within, uh, within National Institute of Mental Health. But later, Congress decided that the services part is not effective within NIMH. Congress established the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, in 1992 and charged the federal agency with uh, effectively targeting mental health and substance abuse services to the people in greatest need and also translating mental health and substance abuse research into the general health system more quickly and effectively. So SAMHSA consistently works to demonstrate that prevention works, that treatment is effective, and that people with mental illness and substance use disorder can recover. So to accomplish this work, uh, SAMHSA administer administers 
a combination of um, competitive formula and block grant programs and data collection activities. Um, the two major block grants SAMHSA manages are the Community and Health Services block grant, block grant, or MHBG, and the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment block grant, or called the SABG. Um, so SAMHSA's Center for Mental Health Services manages the mental health block grant or MHBG. Um, Ethan, so before, what, be, yeah. before you move on, could you just explain what block grant means? Why is it called a block grant? Sure. Um, that's a very good question, Jane. So why the block grant means that it is a block of money um, that is given to the state. So I have a slide later in the um, in the presentation about why um, how uh, the states are getting the money the way it is um, but basically what that means is um, they are getting a block of money um, you know regardless of um, what they submit in the application um, so it's a set amount of money they get uh, um, and a formula which is based on set by Congress so that's why it's called a block Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, so what is the mental health block grant? Um, so the federal mental health block grant is the largest single federal funding stream dedicated to mental health services from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, the states and territories use the mental health block grant uh, to finance innovative mental health services, to help them convene mental health planning councils, and to develop and implement plans uh, for a comprehensive community-based mental health system services. Uh, the mental health block grant uh, approximately serves 7 million people a year. Um, so states basically rely on a combination of mental health block grant funds, state general revenue funds, and Medicaid to pay for mental health services uh, that supports the treatment and recovery um, of people. So I, the reason I wanted to give you this context is um, also to talk about why the mental health block grant is the way the mental health block grant is, you know, so that you get an, a, a basic understanding. So states have significant power in, in making decisions about their mental health systems uh, with the mental health block grant. So mental health regulations and, uh, um, are, you know, because mental health services and regulations are uh, very different from state to state and even from a county to another county. Um, so state mental health systems, um, you know, with mental health block grant must meet certain standards set by the federal government, but they are free to expand beyond what exists at the federal level and uh, to improve, you know, services, access, and protections for consumers. So this freedom to experiment with the new um, or innovative services and delivery models allows states to create improvements that can ultimately be translated across the country. So Mental Health Block Grant um, is basically a flexible source of funding uh, for the states. So uh, who are our grantees? Um, so uh, the Mental Health Block Grant, like I said, is the largest dedicated flexible funding source from the federal government um, to support the development and implementation of a comprehensive community-based system of care. Um, so SAMHSA's uh, Center for Mental Health Services, um, you know, manages and administers the Mental Health Block Grant funds. The Community Mental Health Services Block Grant program is a formula grant awarded to all 50 states, uh, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and six specific jurisdictions to provide community mental health services. So we award 59 uh, awards each year. And each state has a state mental health agency, or we call it the SMHA. Um, so that state mental health agency is responsible for administrating the mental health block grant at that state. Um, so those are our grantees. So in fiscal year 2018, the total allocation uh, for mental health block grant is $722 million. Um, so they, the states are getting this money through a formula. Um, so each formula calculates, um, you know, um, state, state shares based on three formula components that are measured using indicators derived from state-level data. Um, so the size of the population in need, 
the cost of providing services, and the state's fiscal capacity. So, um, so these are the three uh, basic things that are going into how do we calculate the formula uh, that gives each of the state uh, a certain section, certain amount of money. So, for example, California gets the largest amount, um, and uh, you know Guam or Palau, you know they get, you know they get the least. Um, so there is a wide vari variation of uh, money that goes from you know territories to you know states like California or New York. Um, so there is that huge difference, but that difference is based on these three particular uh, indexes. Um, so there are other things that goes into the calculation, but basically these three are the most important ones. But also a key feature of these formulas is that they are not designed to create incentives for state or local entities by rewarding or penalizing their behavior with respect to mental health care and or substance use treatment and or prevention. For example, the formulas do not take into account other public or private funding for mental health and substance use services raised by states or localities, um, the level of care provider or the number of people receiving services in a state. So none of those things are taken into consideration when we um, use this formula to allocate the funding. And also to let you know that this, fund, this funding formula is um, not created by SAMHSA. These are created by Congress itself. So we cannot change the formula mm -hmm. just like that. It needs a congressional action. So Ethan, when, was broke, the last, what, excuse me, when was the yeah. formula created and does it change? Um, the, so the formula was created in 1981, um, so it hasn't changed since then. Uh, but actually with the 21st Century Cures Act, which was passed uh, last year, Congress asked SAMHSA to uh, relook at the formula. So we have, uh, along with the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, we are looking at this formula to see if there is any way we can change. Um, so. Congress basically asked us to study um, the current situation based on the context and let them know. Um, so we will be submitting recommendations to Congress uh, sometime in September. Um, so that's wow. something which is in the congressional uh, requirement within the 21st Century Cures Act, which we are currently working on. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, um, so mental health block and spending. So, Mental health broken for states um, are accounted for 1.1% of the total state spending on mental health services, um, including the state share of, of Medicaid spending. So um, it is a very nominal uh, amount of money when you think about the entire state's mental health broken, uh, state's mental health spending. So states spend more than $42 billion in mental health care, um, but, you know, mental health broken is less than or approximately 1.1% of the total men, mental health spending. Um, states use the mental health block grant to cover services and supports that private insurance or Medicaid will not reimburse, including um, and many times identification and outreach activities, um, supporting evidence-based practices, including assertive community treatment, permanent supportive housing, supported employment, uh, consumer-operated services, and or crisis services or, you know, things which are not paid through Medicaid. Um, so in addition, the mental health program also provides services to individuals who have no other means to pay for behavioral health care. Um, so states have that kind of a flexibility when they administer the mental health program. So despite the modest share of mental health program in total uh, state mental health authority financial resources for community mental health services, um, states report that mental health, uh, the, the block grant provides a critical source of flexible funding that allows them to be innovative in providing services and in pursuing the goals of transforming their mental health systems. So many states have observed that unlike Medicaid, Medicare, and many other federal funding streams, the mental health block grant is not tied to reimbursing specific services. Uh, but instead are allocated to states to use for the highest priority areas identified in their applications to SAMHSA. A crucial element of the mental health block grant is the role that it plays in the overall state funding of community mental health services. For example, for every dollar the mental health block grant is um, 
granted to the states in 2005, we found out that it complements over $1.50 um, for other state and federal dollars going into the community mental health system. So every dollar, you know, $50 are generated at the state or local level. So while the um, increase is in, in non-mental health block grant funding may not be uh, directly leveraged by the recipient of the mental health block grant, such an increase may have been facilitated by the state's capacity developed uh, with the aid of mental health block grants. So this capacity includes the ability to identify state needs for mental health services, uh, infrastructure to develop community-based services, and the environment to shift the paradigm of treatment from intensive inpatient setting to a community-based setting. So, you know, this could be used for many, many um, kind of activities at the state level. Um, so I wanted to go over some of the things which is in the mental health block and statute. So you, you get an idea as to what the state is applying um, when they apply for the grant money. Um, so there are several things which are required in the mental health block and statute. Um, so I'll go one by one uh, with the, the, the sections, not all the sections, but certain sections which I thought maybe is uh, something which you should know um, and maybe will, will be helpful when you're working with the state officials. Um, so the first thing um, is basically what we wanted the states to think of when they apply for the mental health block grant is to do a needs assessment. Um, so it, it requires the states to undertake a needs assessment, assessment as part of their plan submission to SAMHSA. So there are four key steps which we identified that the states should look into when, they, when they're looking at needs assessment. The first one is to assess the strengths and needs of the service system within the state. Um, second, they should identify unmet service needs and critical gaps for individuals with serious mental illness and children with serious emotional disturbance. Then thirdly, prioritizing state planning activities to include the required target population and priority populations, and then develop uh, goals, objectives, strategies, and performance indicators based on what they, they, what they found. So states could derive these needs assessment based on several resources or sources they have, and some of the things which we always ask them to look at is their prevalence rates and incidence rates in the state, and this way they know what the estimated um, needs that they have. They can also reach out to different organizations like FREDLA or, you know, um, or, you know um, agencies like yours within the, within the state and um, or the mental health planning councils can reach out to others, um, different stakeholders to figure out what is the need uh, in the state at this point and how do we prioritize, uh, prioritize and utilize our resources so that it can meet the needs of the people who are in that state. Um, so that's, that's the first thing they need to submit to us with the application is a needs assessment. Um, under uh, section 1911, um, so... Excuse me, uh, Jason, the, Jason, yes. Jason, I'm sorry. We have a question about the definitions. Are they in the, the section that you, uh, the previous slide, the definition oh, of SMI? for uh, the federal definition of SMI and SCD. Um, so there is a federal definition of SMI and SCD, which was developed in 1993 um, through um, a public registry notice. Um, so if I, uh, you know, I can send it to all of you as to what those definitions are. That would be um, great. The, the, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the federal definitions are, um, you know, if I can say it's a 30,000 foot level, it's uh, it's very uh, flexible, but states have its own definitions on SMI and SCD. Um, you know, there could be, um, you know, um, they, they, they have their own SMI SED definitions which states use um, um, so that, uh, for example, uh, we don't say uh, the functionality, you know, we say that it has to be one of the domains, but states can say what does that mean. So in, in terms of operationalizing the definition, states have much more flexibility. So we don't dictate, for example, if somebody with a borderline personality disorder could uh, get services under you know, a serious mental illness. That's something the state should determine. Um, states have that flexibility to make that kind of a decision. We don't. Um, we don't get interfere with that kind of a decision at the state level because it, it involves cost, um, you know, it involves uh, all kind of things, including, um, you know, resources, staffing, 
um, you know, access and all of those things. So it, states have, states can determine as to what should be, how should they operationalize that definition for SMI and SCD. But I can definitely send you um, what is in, uh, what is, what are those definitions for both SMI and SCD. Okay, thanks. So uh, the first thing, uh, um, you know, um, we ask the state uh, when they submit the application, the mental health block and application, um, is basically to submit a comprehensive, uh, um, to describe their entire system of care for people with mental illness and children with emotional disturbance. So the the, the mental health block grant is authorized by um, Title 19 uh, of Part B of the Public Health Services Act. Um, so SAMHSA will make a fiscal year grant to the state after receiving the application uh, with the two major items, you know, and the first one is the statute requires a description of the state's uh, comprehensive system of care for individuals with SMI and SCD. Um, MHBG or the Mental Health Block Grant funds, you know, may be or may not be used for all of those activities, but the statute requires the state to submit to us the entire system of care for people with mental illness, um, what the state, how the state uh, is organized, you know, what kind of services the state provides for people with mental illness, and, and, and so they submit that to us, and it's required by statute. Um, so what that does is that this information will help SAMHSA understand the whole of the applicant or the state's efforts and identify how SAMHSA can assist the applicant or the state in meeting its goals. Um, so in addition to this information, um, you know, uh, states identify uh, models and, you know, and, and evidence-based practices and all of those things which we can definitely say, hey, you know, please look at Maryland or, uh, you know, Washington, and maybe we can have that peer-to-peer -to -peer learning too, you know, so that uh, we know that something is good. Something good is happening in one state, and maybe we can refer them to the other state to look at it. So uh, we use that kind of thing for that kind of purposes too. Uh, then the second thing is that the state uh, has to address five criteria based uh, described in the statute. So I'll go through them one by one uh, in the next few slides. So the five criteria that the states are required to submit to us is. Um, one is um, a comprehensive community-based mental health systems, um, the mental health system data epidemiology, children's services, and targeted services to rural and homeless population and to older adults and management systems. Um, so these are the five broad criteria that each of the um, applicants or the states submit to us and we review each one of them um, and we basically go back and forth with the state to see what they meant by certain things. Um, so one, two, four, and five is targeted for you know adults, and uh, one through five is targeted to children. Um, so you know the adults and children, they have to tell us what the state is doing in terms of all of those five criteria. So the first one is the uh, the comprehensive community based mental health system. Um, so the state has to describe to SAMHSA what does that mean. Um, state must uh, tell us or describe um, how they established and how they implemented an organized community-based system of care, uh, including those with the co-occurring mental and substance use disorders. Um, states uh, must have uh, available services and resources uh, within a comprehensive system of care. Uh, provided with the uh, federal, state, or other public and private resources. Um, and in order to, you know, provide services outside of inpatient or residential, residential institutions to the maximum extent of their capabilities. So this include uh, um, health and mental health services, uh, rehabilitation services, employment services, housing services, educational services, substance abuse services, medical and dental care, and other supportive services such as, um, you know, working with the local school system and uh, description of case management services and all of these activities and letting SAMHSA know how does all of these things help reduce um, or decrease the um, hospitalization of individuals or institutionalization of individuals. Um, and that's, that's something which we look into at this particular criteria or description that states submit to us. 
The second uh, criteria we look at is the mental health system data and epidemiology. Um, so this should include an estimate of the incidence and prevalence in the state uh, for you know children for adults with a serious mental illness and uh, children with a serious emotional disturbance and how quantitative targets to be achieved in the implementation of system of care described in the in the previous slide. So the state has to look at it and say, hey, you know, we don't have uh, um, enough case management services, so the state may be looking at that as a uh, particular initiative for this year, you know, how to increase case management services, or they can say we don't have enough medication-assisted treatment, you know, how do we want it to increase that particular thing in the state at this moment based on the needs assessment. So the, the, the system uh, data and the epidemiology basically should tell us or derive the state based on actual needs, and um, that also helps the state to, you know, come up with some quantitative target uh, they could achieve at the end of the fiscal year. And when they report to SAMHSA, they could, you know, um, look at and say, hey, you know, we worked on this, you know, this helped, and uh, this was the number when we first started, and this is how it is um, at the end of the fiscal year. Um, the, the, the third one is related to children's services. Um, so, you know, the, the, the state must describe how they provide a system of integrated services in order for children to receive care um, with multiple needs, uh, because we know that when uh, children with a serious emotional disturbance getting into the system, it's not just their um, issues with mental health needs, but they also have a lot of other things that comes up with it. So services should be integrated into a comprehensive system of care, um, including social services, educational services, um, services provided under the IDEA, or Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, juvenile justice services, substance abuse services, you know, health issues and all of those things has to be looked into when you provide children services. So we wanted states to states to tell us how they provide a comprehensive array of services for children, um, you know, um, throughout the state. So, Tyson, could we pause here for one second uh, related to children's services because this is an interest of probably every single person on the call here. If we could just go back to the previous slide. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, we've had a question of, you, you don't need to go back one more slide, but you did mention needs assessment. And there's a question yeah. from Linda about who is responsible for conducting the needs assessment. So usually the state is responsible for doing the needs assessment, but then, you know, state can, um, you know, ask for help or assistance, you know, because for us, it is the state. You know, sometimes the mental health planning council could do this uh, for the state or the state can contract with somebody to do this. Uh, but ultimately, for us, it is the responsibility of the state to do the state needs assessment. Okay. Linda, does that answer your question? Um, and related to children's services, okay, she said yes. Related to children's services, so you've identified a lot of different types of children's services. So those have to be, so the, the proposal submitted to SAMHSA has to address what are they doing to establish a system of integrated social, educational, juvenile services and substance abuse. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to use block grant funds for that purpose. Is that correct? Right, right. They don't. This is um, only... So... Okay. Yeah, so they don't have to use mental health block grant for any of these things. You know, what we wanted to know is that does the state have these kind of activities. So, for example, many of you know the system of care uh, grants that, you know, mm -hmm. we have through our children's uh, side. Um, they could use, you know, the system of care model for, or, you know, the funding through that particular grant uh, to do a lot of children's services um, in the state. Or the state may be engaged in a lot of uh, activities with the uh, um, you know, their Department of Children and Families or, you know, with um, other mm -hmm. departments um, um, 
So, you know, they don't have to use mental health block grant, but they could use the mental health block grant for um, all of these kind of things. You know, if they wanted to set up meetings, if they wanted to use it for uh, training and technical assistance, you know, the state have that flexibility because they wanted to develop a system of care for children and coordination between different uh, state agencies, federal agencies, local communities, so that they can provide a comprehensive um, treatment and recovery or resiliency services for children. Um, but yeah, mental health block grant is flexible in that way, but they don't have to use mental health block grant for these kind of services. Is there anything identified that they cannot use the block grant funds for? Yeah, I have a slide, at, I think, towards the end of okay. prohibited we'll things. Okay, we'll get to that. <laughs> no, yeah. We'll be patient. Okay. I'm sorry. And jump back <laughs> No out. problem. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Thank you for pausing there. Oh, no problem. Um, thanks for asking those questions. And Linda, one more thing. I know you asked for a needs assessment. Um, we recently did a um, couple of needs assessment webinars. Um, so if you're interested, um, we can send that to you. Um, we have those slides. Uh, we targeted those needs assessment webinar for the states um, as to how to do the needs assessment at the state level. You know, what are the things they could look into? How do they, um, you know, what kind of resources they can use? Um, so it's a two-part webinar we did for the states recently. Um, so if anyone is interested, please let me know, and I can send you the slides. Yeah, I think probably we'd all like to see that slide, those slides. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Very good. We'll do. So the fourth uh, um, uh, criteria that we look uh, under Section 1912 is basically having this, you know, how, how the state um, is providing outreach and other services to individuals who are experiencing homelessness, um, people who are living in rural areas, and also uh, community-based services for older adults. Um, so states can tell us, you know, how do they um, help people in those three, you know, um, in, the, in those three areas, um, rural, rural, um, rural areas, um, you know, people who are experiencing homelessness, and uh, people who are um, or community-based services to older adults, and these are all for you know people with uh, serious mental illness or uh, children with you know serious emotional disturbance. But we wanted to know how state provide these services to these three um, targeted populations. The last thing we look at is how is the state organizing, organized itself in terms of uh, financial resources, staffing, training for mental health services providers, um, and uh, how do they provide emergency um, health services, um, and how do they expend uh, their money uh, during that fiscal year. So, you know, state basically, you know, send us um, you know, information regarding their management information system, how Medicaid uh, fundings are uh, incorporated, um, you know, what kind of other state general funds are available, um, you know, what the, the way the state is organized. Um, so we get an understanding as to what their fiscal capacity is. And then uh, we also um, have the statutory requirement of um, who the community mental health programs are, because the mental health program monies are, are required by the statute to provide uh, uh, or provided through the community mental health program. So um, the services um, or the plan um, under the plan are provided only by qualified community mental health programs. Um, so they include uh, community mental health centers, uh, child mental health programs, psychosocial rehab programs, mental health peer support programs, or primary consumer-directed programs. So in order for a CMHC to qualify under this criteria, the statute clearly says that they should uh, provide services principally to individuals residing in a defined service area, uh, provide outpatient services for adults with uh, serious mental illness and children with serious emotional disturbance, um, the elderly, residents discharged from inpatient and mental health facilities, uh, they should be providing 24-7 emergency care services, um, provide their treatment or other partial hospitalization program or psychosocial rehab uh, services, um, they should be providing screening for patients who are being, dis uh, being considered for admissions to state mental health facilities to, to, de to determine the appropriateness of such admission. 
uh, providing services to individuals who reside or are employed in the service area regardless of individuals' ability to pay for services and provide quality, accessible services promptly. So these are some of the things which a community mental health center should have in order for them to provide the services through mental health block grant that in the statute. So one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about is you know the reason why we have mental health block grant, and I and you know and I think I mentioned this in the very beginning. The mental health block grant is a flexible set of funding for the states. Um, so one of the things the state does with the mental health block grant funding is to provide or uh, or start or pilot uh, innovative services. Um, you know whether it is an evidence-based practices or something which the state thinks that is uh, is good for the entire state. Um, they could uh, start a pilot program somewhere. Um, so these are all something which is um, embedded in the mental health block grant. So in in 2014, um, states have been required to use um, mental health block grant set aside funds to support evidence-based treatment programs, specifically for individuals experiencing a first episode of psychosis. So I have few slides, and I will I'll start with uh, what it is. Um, so reducing the duration of untreated psychosis is linked to cost savings and improved outcomes. Um, so mental health block grant funds are being used to establish these critical programs as well as cover services not covered under Medicaid or private insurances, um, including uh, supported education, supported employment, otherwise other, other, uh, other, uh, as well as other um, essential treatment elements such as like medication or medication management care coordination or case management. So since the set-aside funding began, the number of states operating the FEP or the first episode psychosis treatment program supported by the mental health block grant that uses a coordinated specialty care, which is an evidence-based model, has more than doubled or tripled. You know, In 2014, the first year uh, of the set-aside, 17 states had existing coordinated specialty care programs. At the beginning of the fiscal year 17, 41 states offered 154 coordinated specialty care programs supported by Mental Health Block Grant in urban, rural, and uh, frontier areas. Currently, there are more than 270 such programs across the country. The reason I wanted to bring that to your attention is basically because you know the the flexibility of uh, the the Mental Health Block Grant in promoting evidence-based practices quickly. So from 2014 to 2018, we have from you know a few programs to more than 270 programs that provide services for those with a first episode psychosis. So from research to service, what the mental health block grant can do, mental health block can, uh, do is amazing. So why we focus on a first episode psychosis? So First episode psychosis simply refers to the first time someone experiences psychotic symptoms or a psychotic episode. So these include a full-blown psychotic, psychotic episode, um, having a, a hallucinations or delusions or um, issues specifically related to psychosis. Um, so psych, you know, people experiencing a first episode may not understand what is happening um, many times. Uh, the symptoms can be highly disturbing and unfamiliar leaving the person confused and distressed, including the family members. So unfortunately, negative myths and stereotypes about mental illness and psychosis in particular are still common you know, in, in our communities. So often there is a long delay before treatment begins for the first episode psychosis. So the longer the illness is left untreated, the greater the disruption of the person's family, friends, studies, and work. So this is what we call the duration of uh, untreated illness or the duration of untreated psychosis or DUP, which have serious consequences for the individuals and families. So um, in terms of um, you know, psychosis, if psychosis is uh, detected and treated early, many problems can be prevented. Um, so research shows that individuals experiencing psychosis traditionally wait more than two years to seek treatment. The way that individuals feel about themselves can be adversely affected, particularly um, if treatment is prolonged. Um, other problems may occur or intensify, such as unemployment, 
uh, depression, substance use, um, or you know, involvement with the juvenile justice um, or self-injury, um, all of those things are associated with this. So onset of psychosis is most common um, among transition age youth, especially between ages 15 and 25, and can be disruptive you know, for um, their normal developmental process of uh, um, individuation, adoption of adult roles and responsibilities, and the formation of adult identities. So it is very important that you know, these individuals are identified early and into the program as fast as we can, that the, that the prognosis of these illnesses are better with the early identification and treatment. So that's why um, we have these first episode psychosis programs throughout the country. Um, it is not only uh, the, you know, we are saving lives for, of people who have psychosis, but also it is much more cost effective for states um, in terms of not treating the psychosis early enough. Jason, this is a, also a major issue for uh, family-run organizations and peer support providers for families because, as you noted, often the onset is in late adolescence or, or early adulthood. And um, families are, you know, caught by surprise here. A child who has had um, and call it uneventful childhood or something, and then begins to uh, ha have this first episode psychosis or symptoms prior to that. And um, one of the components of this EBP practice for first episode psychosis is family education and support. Mm -hmm. And family-run organizations can play a critical role in during that period of time in supporting families. Um, Fredla, about, I believe, a year ago, did a learning community on first episode psychosis. And there is a directory of programs. Um, we can get that information out as well. It would be very um, helpful to connect with some of those programs, let them know who you are and how you can be a support to some of these families, perhaps it's an opportunity even for you to develop your uh, own first episode psychosis support education program. There are um, models out there for that, and we can provide that information as well. But um, because of this set aside, as you noted, um, and the critical unmet need in this area, it is certainly a, a growing opportunity for uh, all of us to fill this need. Okay, thanks. Oh, thank you, Jane. I think uh, thanks for that, uh, um, you know, uh, clarification. So one of the things I forgot to mention is that the states are required to set aside 10% of their mental health block and money for this particular initiative. So if the state is getting $100 million from SAMHSA for block grant, uh, 10 million has to be dedicated for the first episode psychosis program that is mandated by Congress. So they cannot use that money for anything else other than the first episode psychosis initiative. Um, uh, Congress in 2016 uh, with the um, 21st Century Cures Act basically codified this in the statute and basically saying that it's not only the first episode psychosis, they could use it also for early serious mental illness. So any early serious mental illness could be used, but the only caveat the state, uh, Congress basically told us or told, you know, is, is put in the statute is that it has to be an evidence-based practice um, that benefits the person who have an early serious mental illness. So right now, the, the most effective um, program that we have is the coordinated specialty care, which is the CSE model developed uh, uh, by, you know, through research at NIMH, through the RACE study, um, and that is what most of the states use. Um, there are different variations, um, uh, but, you know, they call themselves different names, um, on track New York, on track Maryland, Navigate program are some of the CSC models that you could see or he you heard. Um, and I agree with uh, Jane that, you know, you, ha you have a critical role to play in this, um, especially with family psychoeducation, which is one of the 
most important aspect of all of these things because uh, family support uh, is one of the most important natural support for a person who has psychosis and um, having that support from families is, you know, greatly improve um, the prognosis in many ways in terms of supporting the person but also supporting each other, um, you know, supporting, um, you know, support throughout, uh, you know, the, the course of the illness is, is very helpful. Yep. Is, and, this uh, the only, is this the only set aside in the block grant for the early uh, first episode psychosis? Are there right. other set aside? Uh, there is another thing called children set aside, which I'm going to talk right now. But the, the only set aside we have is, the, you know, in terms of a percentage of the money that goes to states is the 10% the set aside, we call it, you know, or the FEP set aside, first episode cycle. That was created in 2014 by Congress, um, you know, and uh, um, we got appropriation through 2016, but in 2016 it is codified into law. So now, you know, uh, with the mental health block and statute, it is required uh, for states to expend their 10% of the set of their mental health block grant for this particular set aside. Mm -hmm. So the next one, I think uh, Jane just asked about set aside. Uh, so there is another set aside, which is the children's set aside. Um, so um, states are required to provide systems of integrated services for children with the. Uh, uh, serious emotional disturbance. Um, so the state must ma maintain the fiscal year 1994 level of expenditures for each year uh, thereafter. So whatever they spent in 1994 is what their set aside will be and referred to as the children set aside. Um, so state must, must spend on children with serious emotional disturbance at least as much as they spent in 1994. Um, states can include but are not limited to state general funds, uh, state match funds for Medicaid, federal funds, mental health block grant funds, or any combination thereof. So this set aside, this set aside is not just a mental health block grant set aside. It is a, the, the set aside for the entire state. So if the state was spending $50 million in 1994 for children's services, they cannot come back today and say that mm, we don't have budget, we don't have money we cannot spend 50 million, we're going to reduce the budget to 49 million. You know, that, that's not allowed uh, with the mental health broken statute. So um, if there is a shortfall in funding available for children's mental health services, the state may request a waiver uh, from SAMHSA. Uh, however, as long as the state has spent more than their 1994 levels, uh, they met this requirement, but a waiver may be granted if the you know, HHS secretary determines that the state is providing an adequate level of comprehensive community mental health services for children with uh, this emotional disturbance um, by comparing the number of children in need of such services with the services actually available within the state. Um, so, you know, um, but we looked at different things when they submit uh, the waiver, but we haven't had any state submit any waiver for a long time because if you look at 1994, um, the spending, the overall spending of mental health, mental health itself is very less, you know, compared to where we are right now. But the statute uh, has this in the, um, um, the in, in, you know, the, the statute has this um, criteria in there so that the state cannot spend less than what they spend for children in 1994. Is there any way to get that data per state, that cost per state? Yeah. We have a question from Terry about that. Sure, uh, we can definitely send that to you. You know, but you know, like uh, it is 24 years ago. That is true. You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I yeah. know. Um, but we do yeah. have. Uh, we can. Uh, you know, what the state submitted to us in 1994. That's our baseline. Um, so we have that baseline um, of expenditures from 1994. Um, so Jane, I can mm -hmm. send that to you. You can share it with the states. You know, it's a it's a public document. So then we have a question from Delphi about how do we know if the dollars are set aside for children? That some states are not transparent in their yeah. Budget. So Delphi, the question you have is that does the state mental health block grant have any set aside for children? Um, they don't have to set aside a certain amount of money for, you know, mental health broadband for children, you know, it's up to the state. Um, 
you know, but you know, the the only thing they need to prove to us with the you know with the children that they say is that the overall expenditure for the state uh, for the children services are, um, you know, um, above that 1994 limit. Um, so they don't have to, you know, there is no requirement in the in the mental health block grant statute that a certain percentage of the money has to be set aside for children services. So are the mental health block grants public information? People could request them from their state? Mm -hmm. Are they available? So I have, a, I have a slide specifically on that. Maybe we can talk that, uh, Jane, later. Okay. I have, yeah, I have a, a little bit more information yeah, yeah. on why. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Perfect questions, you know. You're, you're to the point. Um, so the next thing is that uh, there is also uh, something in the mental health block and related to state maintenance of effort. So the states are required to submit sufficient information for the secretary or to SAMHSA to make a determination of compliance with the statutory maintenance of effort or MOE requirements. So the MOE information is necessary to document that the state has maintained expenditures for community mental health services at a level that is not less than the average level of such expenditures maintained by the state for the previous two years um, when the state is applying for the grant. So the state shall only include community mental health services expenditures for individuals that meet the federal and state definition of SMI and uh, SCD. Um, so the, the whole thing is that even though we have a 1994 state expenditure uh, for children, there is an overall state expenditure uh, which we require the states to maintain. For example, if the state was spending a uh, billion dollars um, in the last two fiscal years, um, they cannot spend less than that billion dollars this fiscal year. Um, so, um, so that's the maintenance of effort, you know. So during the recession, um, we had a lot of state cut mental health budgets. Um, so there are certain exceptions where they can submit a waiver uh, for waiver to SAMHSA. Um, so these waivers are um, include, you know, why uh, the state uh, has a decreased mental health budget. Um, so we look into all kinds of things, you know, certain things like, for example, the unemployment in the state is going up, um, the total revenue for the state is going down. Um, so these kind of things we look into. Um, so those, um, so once the state uh, submit to us the expenditures, they also submit to us a waiver request um, to SAMHSA to look at. But ultimately, the secretary can either say, no, we are not going to approve this waiver. Um, you have to increase your funding. So the good thing about the whole maintenance of effort within the mental health block and statute, even though the mental health block and funding is 1% uh, of the state, that 1% funding controls the entire budget, you know, for the state mental health. Um, so, you know, states usually don't want to lose the mental health block grant, you know, basically because they are decreasing the, the overall state expenditures for people with, uh, for, for their mental health budget. So that maintenance of effort make miracles, you know, in terms of how states determine their budget for um, fiscal years. So I think uh, there are some questions and Jane wanted me to talk about the state mental health planning councils. So each state is required to establish and maintain a state mental health planning or advisory council. And in many states, they report directly to the secretary of, a, you know, of their health and human services or their state mental health um, to provide a independent you know, consultation or um, um, recommendations. So, so meet, to meet the needs of the state uh, that are integrating services supported by mental health and mental health block grant and substance abuse block grant, um, SAMHSA in 2000, um, I believe in 2012 or 13, um, that um, you know they combined the uh, mental health block grant uh, with their state um, substance abuse uh, planning councils if they have one. Um, but uh, we also encouraged uh, the mental health block and uh, planning council, the mental health planning council, uh, to include uh, uh, you know people uh, people who are uh, or providers from uh, substance use prevention, substance use uh, substance use disorder treatment, um, recovery you know council if they have one, 
you know, so those kind of things. So that we, we, we thought that expanding the advisory counts will also help with uh, uh, not only with people with mental illness, but also people with men mental illness and substance use disorders, and also to talk about behavior health in general. Um, so planning councils are required by statute uh, to review state plans, um, what they submit to us uh, for application, um, the implementation reports, and, uh, and if the state is submitting any modification to their application. Um, so planning councils in general monitor uh, the, 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 the application and the state plan, uh, they review, um, some of them do evaluations, um, but you know, uh, they do this uh, once a year. Um, and they also look at the um, adequacy of mental health services within the state. They also look at the allocation of uh, mental health funds that goes into the state, not just the mental health block grant, but they also look at you know how the state mental health program and state mental health allocations are going. So they also serve as an advocate for individuals with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and also SAMHSA requests that any recommendations or modifications to the application or comments to the implementation report that were received from the planning council also be submitted to SAMHSA regardless of whether the state has accepted their recommendation. Um, so the documentation, we usually say, hey, preferably uh, and assigned by the chair of the planning council, um, and also um, the, the planning council chair should let us know in, in, in his or her letter that they reviewed the application and implementation report and uh, should transmit all those attachments to SAMHSA. So some of the key statutory requirements for planning council is that you know, there are strict uh, state council membership guidelines as prescribed uh, in the statute. Um, so they are state residents only. Um, there should be pri public and private entities uh, concerned uh, with the need, uh, planning, operation, funding, and use of mental health services and related supported services. And representative from several state agencies is mandated. Um, so mental health, uh, you know, Department of Education, Department of Vocational Rehab, uh, criminal justice, housing, social services, and Medicaid agencies are required um, members of the planning council at the state level. We also have uh, um, um, requirements uh, include adults with uh, serious mental illness in recovery from serious mental illness who are receiving mental health services. Uh, we have um, requirements of families of adults or children with a semi or a CD. Um, mm -hmm. You also, uh, states also has to tell us that the ratio of patient uh, or ratio of parents of children with uh, serious emotional disturbance to other council members is sufficient to provide adequate represent representation for that constituency in deliberation on the council. So that may be is an interest for you. Um, and uh, not less than 50% of the members of the council are individuals who are not state employees or providers of mental health services. Mm -hmm. Can we pause here for a sec and sure. ask the people um, if you ha are on your state's planning council, is there family uh, representation? Um, I'll speak from my experience, and we'll hear from Sue Smith in a, a minute, but um, we had far less family representation for children than uh, adult consumers, adult uh, providers. And um, it, was, it was always a struggle for us. Uh, we then requested a children's subcommittee that would have um, child providers, family, and um, we would bring specific issues to the council then, uh, and because they didn't seem to be coming from the council because it was overly adult oriented. And I'm just curious if other people have had that experience as well. I see a couple saying it's um, some say yes, some say yes. Okay. Good. Well, it's something as family organizations we need to be mindful of and 
work with our state to make sure that there are family members, representatives of the family organization, but also other family members who serve on those councils. Are those councils generally by appointment or can somebody request to be on those councils? So, you know, it, it depends upon state. Uh, it varies from state to state. Um, you know, it's okay. usually uh, appoint, appointed by the secretary. They work, you know, under the pressure of the commission or the governor who appoints them to the council. Um, you know, sometimes the states have uh, um, the ability to request or, you know, solicitation on if anybody wanted to be part of the planning council. So it, it varies from state to state. Um, but it's, it depends upon the bylaws of the planning council. Sometimes states have statutory requirements um, related to planning, you know, planning council or councils in general. Um, so it varies from state to state. Mm -hmm. But, but we don't people could the public. Yeah. People could at least express an interest. Definitely, the, definitely. I think that is uh, yeah. that is something yeah. which we recognize. But SAMHSA don't dictate, or SAMHSA won't recommend anybody to be on a council. You know what I mean? The only thing we have is that broad category of uh, council members who should be part of the planning council. But all the 50 states and the six territories and the three associated states, they all have planning councils. Um, we do work with them on a regular basis. Um, very well, good. Jane Ash from Kansas is saying that um, she has worked with Brass Tax on a training to provide family members and adult consumers and children's advocates a training on how to advocate for issues important to them through the council. Is that something you could share, Jane? Uh, she'll be answering in a second. Yeah, she said sure. Okay, okay. Well, I have, I'm have. i making a whole list of things that we will get out to people who are registered for this call. And so, Jane, we'll, we'll touch base after this and uh, see about getting that out. That would be dynamite. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tizen. Keep All going. Right. Uh, so I think this is the question, Jane, you asked, uh, um, and I think this is one on the next slide. Um, so, you know, state's application implementation report um, should include documentation that they were shared with the planning council. Um, so, you know, the state, like, for example, some states' uh, application is like 400 some pages. So, you know, it has to be reviewed by the, um, by the state planning council, and we have to see the documentation that they were shared with the planning council. And like I mentioned, any recommendation or modification to the application or comments uh, for the implementation report um, should be documented um, and submit to SAMHSA for us to verify that this has happened. Um, and the, the next thing is that the mental health block grant statute requires that as a condition of the funding agreement for the grant, state should provide opportunity for the public to comment on the state plan. So whatever they submit to us must be available to public. So a state should make the plan public in such a manner as to facilitate comment from any person in that state during the development of the plan and after submission of the plan to SAMHSA. So, you know, if anybody wanted to see the, uh, the plan that they submitted to SAMHSA, any person in that state should, be, should have um, the ability to request that. And many states, I believe that they um, they upload that in, in their website where people can see, or they can talk to their mental health uh, planner for each of the state to see if they have a copy of that that could be shared. Uh, but that is a requirement that if anybody wanted to see the plan, they can. We have a question from Linda. Is there recourse available if a state doesn't provide a method for public comment? Um, they can always call us, you know, we can follow up with the state, um, but they can also talk to their mental health uh, uh, planner for the state um, or the mental health planning council chair um, because yeah. these are these are requirements by law, you know, so, you know, they cannot violate the law. So, Linda, you're equipped now to know that there has to be a period of public comment and the planning council may be a way to um, make it known that there hasn't been 
a um, public comment period. The public comment period is different from the Planning Council review. So, right. The um, Planning Council has to review has their to document. Both. Yeah. yeah. And the public comment period, uh, they can submit public comments anytime. You know, even after submission to SAMHSA, they can submit uh, uh, public comments. Um, so um, even if, uh, uh, the, because many times states submit these at the last minute. Um, so they may not have enough time to, uh, pro, you know, send it to, um, for a public comment period. So what we said to state is that they have to post this as soon as the state reviews it, approves it, you know, um, or before that, you know, they have, there should be an ability for public to look at the application or the plan and then provide comments. Um, the ability for uh, states is that they can amend or modify their plan anytime. Um, so even though, even though they have to submit this, um, you know, by statutorily determined dates, um, the state can amend their application anytime. So, you know, um, public has, should have the opportunity to comment on this plan throughout the year. Jason, do you know, do states ever turn back money? Um, not that I know of. Um, so one of the things with the state uh, basically have the ability is that even though it is a year-to-year -year grant, um, states have two years to expand the funds. Um, so what we recognize in many states um, is that, you know, the procurement process, um, you know, it takes time. You know, it's not a private agency. State government has to follow state rules and regulations in terms of how they procure services. So many times it goes through an RFP process, contracting process, and so forth. So mental health block grant allows state to expand their funds in a two-year time frame. So states have, you know, that opportunity to spend them before they touch the next year grant, you know, or, you know, like, for example, this is fiscal year 18. They have up until, you know, they have the fiscal year 17 money through the end of September of this year to, you know, complete. So it's, uh, they have that opportunity. So usually states don't return money back to the federal government unless there are some major issues, you know, but we haven't had a, had that problem. Okay. And I think, Jane, you also asked about uh, what are the restrictions uh, on grant expenditure. So it is very few. Um, so uh, because the mental health block grant is such a flexible f uh, source of funding, um, so they cannot provide inpatient hospital services for uh, with the mental health block grant money because this is a community-based mental health services um, um, funding. Uh, they cannot make cash payments to intended recipients of health services. They cannot purchase or improve land, um, uh, purchase, construct, or permanently improve buildings other than facility, other or other facilities, purchase major medical equipment costing over $5,000, um, satisfy any requirement for expenditures for non-federal funds as a condition of the receipt of federal funds, meaning that they cannot use this for match money for other programs, um, other federal programs, or provide financial assistance to any entity other than a public or nonprofit private entity. Um, and, and then the other caveat for the states is that states cannot expend more than 5% of the mental health program funds to administer the grant. So there is an administrative expenditure cap for the states, not for the providers, but for the states um, in terms of how much money they can spend on administrative cost. So Jane is asking, what, how do you define administration? Uh, administrative cost, is that what Jane yeah. most probably yeah. asking? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. The, the, the definite, we don't have, um, we have some of those in our a OMB circulars, uh, but most of the time it is based on the cost principles allocated at the state level. Um, so the state determine what is an administrative cost in a North SAMHSA. Um, so for example, uh, in some states, um, certain things are uh, considered administrative, but in some other states it's not. Um, but it, it depends upon how how is your state cost allocation principles are determined at the state level. So um, if you have any questions, you can talk to the state staff. Um, they can figure out what their cost allocation principles are. Um, so they cannot have two different cost allocations. You know, they cannot have one for mental health program and one for some other. Uh, the state general funds or you know other funds they administer 
you know, it has to be um, the same. Um, so we basically go back to the state and said, you know, the way you determine uh, administrative expenditures is by looking at um, the, the cost allocation principle at the state level. And, you know, I think Jane is also asking how do we get this information. I think you most probably have to talk to your uh, state um, fiscal people. Um, they, may, they most probably have the cost allocation principles as to, you know, like a line item budget, you know, in some state maybe that particular thing is considered administrative. In some places it may not be. For example, training um, or for staff, you know, is considered administrative in some places. In some places they consider that as a direct service and not as an administrative thing. So there are wide variations from state to state in terms of how they define um, certain costs. Okay. Okay, so I think that Jane also asked me to just touch base a little bit on, um, did I miss one? Oh, so there is also um, a statutory deadline for state to submit applications. So we have um, states must submit their applications to SAMHSA by September 1st of the fiscal year. Um, so just now they're submitting uh, our applications for fiscal year 19. Um, the annual reports are due on December 1st. You know, that, that is in the statute. Um, stamps cannot change those dates, but um, these are in the, these are law. By law, the states have to submit those applications by the due date. Um, the substance abuse prevention and treatment block end, um, uh, I think Jane just asked me to talk about a little bit about this, uh, but most of you know that the SABG or the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant is one of the largest funding for substance abuse and prevention for the states. Um, for mental health, you know, a lot of states, it is 1% of the total allocation of for mental health budget, but in, for substance abuse, it is the other way around. In most of the states, this has a major funding for substance abuse treatment and prevention. Um, the substance abuse block grant is around $1.1 billion that goes to states, um, which is not managed uh, within our division, which is managed under the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment within SAMHSA. Uh, but I don't want to go through all of those things, but those are, there are 10 criteria that they look at, or uh, you know, there are 10 priorities uh, within the, um, and, and the substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant that um, requires uh, states to submit and look at. Um, interestingly enough, um, in, two th in 2000, um, um, I cannot remember when it was, a few years ago or several years ago, uh, SAMHSA encouraged a state to submit a combined application for both SABG and MHBG. So right now there are 36 or 39, 39 states submit a joint application. So they don't have to submit two different applications. They submit one single application to SAMHSA for both grants for both MHBG and SABG. Um, so um, before I close, I just want to conclude some stuff, you know, which I wanted to, you know, um, say. So every year, states submit to SAMHSA extensive information about their public mental health system, as well as goals and actions the state will undertake to achieve these goals. Although the mental health block grant requires state to develop and implement these comprehensive community-based plans, it alone does not provide sufficient resources for any state to implement these goals. Rather, the Mental Health Block Grant supplements other financial resources available to the state and creates the external environment, for example, the planning council, the comprehensive mental health plans, the maintenance of effort requirements, and the federal review of state plans. And that have helped lead to the fundamental transformation of state mental health systems over the last 35 years. Since the Mental Health Block Grant was first um, funded in 1982, state mental health authorities and state mental health systems have seen a historic transition from state psychiatric hospital-based care to community-based care. Um, in the year before the initiation of Mental Health Block Grant, state mental health authorities reported that only 33% of their resources were spent on community-based mental health services while 63% were devoted to state psychiatric hospital or inpatient expenditures. But by 1993, the distribution of state expenditures has shifted uh, so that roughly equal amounts were expended in state psychiatric hospital and community-based services. 
Um, the community mental health services expenditures greatly increased throughout the 1990s and in the early part of this decade. And most recent data demonstrate that over 70% of SAMHSA or, or state resources are now devoted to community-based services. So this shift in resource allocation paradigm is supported mainly by the substantial increase in available community mental health block grant funding. On one hand, uh, uh, you know, states are constrained with the expenditures for state psychiatric hospitals. On the other hand, you know, they are increasing the community mental health funding. From, uh, 2000, uh, from 1981 to 2005, expenditures for state psychiatric hospitals decreased from um, $8 billion to $3.8 billion, while community-based mental health services expenditures increased in that same period, same period from $2 billion to $20 billion, an increase of 916-fold. So in real terms, when uh, state expenditures were adjusted for inflation, the increase in community-based services remained very, very significant. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to let you know that even though the mental health block grant is 1% of the total mental health spending in this country, um, it has an enormous change in the way the community-based mental health services are provided throughout. Um, so let me stop there, stop here, and uh, I know that there is only 10 more minutes, and uh, let me hand it over to Sue Smith. Well, I want to begin by thanking you, Tison. Wow, I hope other people learned uh, as much as I did. This, I was on the planning council for many years, but much of this information was new to me. So thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to introduce Sue Smith, the Executive Director of Georgia Parents Corp. And if you missed it, today's Sue's birthday, so we'll all be uh, singing happy birthday while you present, Sue. Take it away with your uh, experiences with the Planning Council in Georgia. Uh, thanks, everyone across the nation. Thanks for my happy birthday songs. Uh, at this age, you actually have to celebrate each one a lot. So I wanted to talk about the Planning Council because it was such an opportunity and we've heard everything technical about it and I want to talk about everything that isn't technical about it because for those of you who know me, that's kind of where I live. Uh, I was at the first block grant when we heard about this wonderful opportunity from Washington and it was amazing. Um, we had this big party, we had great food. Uh, many of you will know Dawn Morgan who just retired from Georgia. Uh, she and I sat together and she ate my chocolate dessert, uh, which was not unusual. And so we heard about these great things. And from the other end of the state, Waycross, Georgia, my friends Bill and Terry were there. Georgia has always been a, a state that, that welcomed families, involved families, and tried to support families in coming to the block grant, which was really cool. So we heard great things about what the plan was going to do and how it was going to work and we spent most of a day in this grand celebration. And so about midnight that night, my friend Bill and Terry called and they said, all of this isn't going to happen right now, is it? I said, no, I, I'm afraid to tell you that I do not believe everything on this wonderful plan is going to happen right now. And, and they were having a really bad situation in their home. and. I heard them start crying, and I never heard from them again, no matter how many times I called. Uh, so I'm not sure in the beginning we made plain that it was a plan, and that the plan probably had years, if ever, that plan, probably it was a fluid plan where things would change before it ever got funded completely. So that was the beginning, and uh, I, I do want to say that um, I, I wrote notes as you went about things that I thought were important from the non-technical point of view. I've served as chair either two or three times in these years and co-chair of the Children's Committee at least most of the years. Uh, there have been years when, when I didn't choose to do that. Uh, Georgia has been inclusive of our four major um, Advocacy organizations, that would be the Georgia Parent Support Network with Georgia's Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, NAMI Georgia, Mental Health America, Georgia, and uh, the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, which wasn't around at the beginning, but pretty rapidly came along. Um, there are different levels of participation. 
Um, we have people who come, people who show up, people who work, people who are on committees, uh, and it's changed over the years. We started with a small group of people. Georgia's changed over the years. There's way more advocacy, knowledge, and involvement than there was all those years ago. And talking around, I think, we decided that this must have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 89 or 90 that all of this started. Um, our council representatives have, uh, the major four advocacy organizations have always had a slot on the, uh, on the planning council. So through the years, um, of course, the people have changed a lot. Some are still the same. But um, so we've always had good representation. Um, there's an opportunity for everyone through collaboration. In the early years, it was mainly us talking to ourselves because there weren't really that many formal organizations and there was very little, if any, collaboration between departments. And through the years, the departments have actually changed. Um, so given that it's kind of a changing ground, um, it's, been, it's been a very interesting process. Um, it, one of the things the council has done through the years is serve to bring people and agencies together. And, and um, each presentation all these years has had information about not only the state and, and people with mental illness and their challenges and, and later addictive diseases and their challenges, but it has uh, it, it educated us about ourselves as a state. Um, it's, it's a really wonderful place to be. Um, I'm going to tell you one story. I wish I could hear you laugh on this one, but of course that won't be possible. Um, years ago, children did not have equality. There was a handful of children's representatives, and, and there were parents and there were agencies, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the representatives were, um, were for the adult population. So I asked, as, as chair of the Children's Committee, that we have a vote and we wanted equal representation. And so a really famous national leader that lived in Georgia said to me, not, did not work for the state, let me make that clear, uh, said to me, no, they're more adults, they're more needy, and they're sicker than children. And so <laughs> this was back in the day when we really didn't know a lot and we didn't have internet to look it up either. And so, okay, so this went on for a couple of years. And, and during this time, uh, others of you may know Cynthia Wayne Scott. We put our heads together. So was, there was this huge national conference, and a lot of adults went to the national conference off the council. And so um, that left us kids people. And there was the, we meet six times a year. It was the time for the meeting, so we had the meeting. And we voted that children would have equal representation. I'm sure you're all laughing, right? And then we held wow. our breath because we knew when everybody got back to town, there would be a big stir. When everybody got back to the next council meeting or read the minutes and then they actually knew it before they came to the council meeting, everybody had a great big laugh and said, one to go. Not at all the, the, the reaction that we expected. And that was many years ago. So I don't know today if we have equal representation. I would say we're pretty close. I don't count anymore because everybody who represents children that wants to be there is there. So I don't have to worry anymore that we have a handful of people and, and we're hardly ever recognized. Um, mental health block grants have been used for all kinds of things in Georgia. It's a, I think in the beginning and maybe still we view it as the great opportunity to be able to look at things we can't do or aren't doing or can't afford with state dollars. We kind of push the limits with it. Uh, some really cool stuff has come out of it. Um, one of the things that was, uh, and I can't go back through the years and tell you budget for budget item, but innovative things like peer supports and peer wellness centers and um, services for children and different, different things that the state would probably not have funded, some demonstration grants. And as you talked earlier, I'm trying to go fast. As you talked earlier about the early psychosis, as far as children go, Georgia was the leaders. We have a complete peer support program, well thought out by the State Department of Behavioral Health and Develop Dis Developmental Disabilities, that has been in the process for about five years. So not only do we have certified peers, we have certified peer parents and certified peer youth. 
and when our early psychosis program, thank you block grant, came into being, it was uh, a, the, the actual involvement of family and youth were part of that criteria. So again, uh, the block grant has served to take Georgia the next step, as it has through all the years. Um, and I wanted to talk about the council itself. It's been an absolute blast for all these years, knowing so many people statewide, hearing so much about all the services and who serves children. And uh, in the years ago, we used to travel the state and just literally we're in every part of the state. And uh, we, I don't know why we stopped, but we did. Don't remember that part, but just recently somebody said, let's start traveling the state again. So it's really, really cool to see what everybody's doing statewide. Ah, okay, I'll give it back to you in case anybody wants to ask me anything. What I would say is for everybody on the line, if, if you're the person in charge of the block grant or the administrators, get your parents involved. And if your parents, get involved because it's just the most incredible opportunity to know people and really connect and being able to serve a what I know, I'm not supposed to say it, but our children. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sue. So I think that's a real testimony to um, the opportunity to get involved, get known, network, as well as be in the room as decisions are made and be able to review um, needs assessments, state plans, budgets, that kind of thing, and at least have input into it. Maybe not as much as you would want, but at least you've got that opportunity. So looking at the clock, uh, it's 4.31 Eastern time. Within a few weeks, we will be announcing our next series of learning communities. Believe it or not, this is actually our last one for our current contract. So our next series will be coming up. Um, I sent, I. Uh, entered in the chat box. We welcome your ideas for future topics, community presenters. Pardon the typos in there. Send your ideas to info at fredla.org. We would love to hear from you. Um, and we really want to thank Gary from our tech team at the University of Maryland School of Social Work for hosting the webinar for us. We could not do it without you, Gary, and your team. And as always, um, to everyone on this call. Thank you for spending part of your day with us, and thank you so much to Tyson and to Sue. Tyson, you want to put your contact information up there? Um, maybe we could. There we go. Um, yep. So that if you have additional follow-up or questions, um, you've got his contact information right there. Um, so use it. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Download the slides. Remember, we are going to be sending you a whole list of information referenced today, the training from Keys for Networking for Planning Council, information on the state's base rate of spending in 1994, the definition of SED, the link to the RAISE study, which is the EBP for first episode psychosis, the directory of first episode psychosis programs, and uh, the link to the webinar Tisa mentioned on how states conduct their needs assessment.